anyways, if you have a Bible, please take your Bible and turn to the book of First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four. We touched on it last week. You know, we're supposed to live our lives. We're supposed to live our lives sanctified in Christ in our hearts, and we want to make God look good. And a lot of times we don't, and we we want to. But how many times have we started the day with good intentions and they end up in, 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 in a dumpster fire? You know, somebody gets our goat, somebody gets on our last nerve, and we say, that's it. What chapter? Four. First Peter chapter four. Um, one of the biggest things that we, okay, let me see, not one of, the biggest thing that we have to watch out for is this old stinking flesh. It is the biggest thing, okay? Sometimes it's what we do that we know we shouldn't do. Sometimes it's how we respond to something else somebody else did. So somebody else does something to us or even to somebody else, but we just, it's, it just gets on our nerves. We're like, what's wrong with that person? All right? But that's our flesh too. That's self-will. That's our self-will imposing itself, trying to, trying to change the world into what image we want it to be instead of the image that God wants it to be. I'm sorry, what chapter am I Four, First Peter chapter 4, brother. First Peter chapter 4. Uh, First Peter and Second Peter are, are really, really good books of the Bible talking about how God relates to us trying to live through this sinful flesh. And if there's anybody that's a good illustration for that, it's Brother Peter. All right, that guy had a strong will, and he was he was one of those that you know you give him a job, it's going to get done. He's going to get he's going to get it done. He might break a few eggs along the way, you know, but you got to break an egg and make an omelet, like I said. Now you know if you're Making orange juice may not be a good idea, but you might still break some eggs. All right, so because uh, some people put orange, eggs in orange juice, uh, different different thing. Okay, yeah, people working out and stuff like that. So in Peter, it talks about our flesh and it talks about the spirit. In verse fifteen of chapter three, it says, "But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear." So we're supposed to give an answer for people that see the hope that is in us. But if somebody saw you this last week, would they have seen a lot of hope coming out of you or they would have seen a lot of your flesh coming out of you? What did the world see coming out of our flesh this last week? That's a good thing to ask. When you put your head down on the pillow tonight, Sunday, June 2nd, 2024, when your head hits that pillow, ask the Holy Spirit and ask yourself, did the world today see Jesus coming through you? Did they see, did he, they see the source of your hope? See, they're not going to ask the source of your hope if they don't see any hope. They're going to go ask somebody else. They're like, oh, boy, that person, they got run over by a Mack truck called Life, and they've not even stood back up yet. So that's how we look sometimes to the world. And if we're, we're going around looking like a, a junkyard dog, you know, everybody looks at us. <laughs> then the world's going to be like, oh, I don't know what they got, but I don't want none of it. I don't want none of it. That's what you call a bad testimony. All right? But first... 1 of chapter 4. Verse 1 says, For as much. So look, it, it, look at that word right there. It sounds like three words put together. For as much. Like for, and the word as, and then much. But it's one word, all right? For as much then, or because, Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He that, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may have sufficed us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. And we talked about this for a second last week too, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Now, the world expects you to jump in the party. The world expects you when the party starts, everybody's coming in. You know, you all, we all know the term block party, and that sometimes is not a bad thing, but sometimes it is. But the world expects the party to pull everybody in around it, sort of like a black hole. Like, like oh, yeah. you know. And yeah, we're throwing a caper at the end of, at the end of first in, in, in Maine over here, and everybody's invited, come on down, you know. That's what the world expects. The world expects that everybody's going to participate in the sin. But the biggest enemy in your life is your flesh unrestrained. Your biggest enemy is letting your flesh do whatever it wants to do. We don't think it is. We don't think that's our enemy. We think our enemy is is the, our neighbor that keeps letting their dog poop in our yard, and doesn't clean it up. You know, we think our enemy is uh, uh, the person at work that's uh, uh, just bothers you every time you come in, and and always has something to criticize you about, and always is saying, "Well, you know that I saw this thing over here, and you just didn't do a very good job on it." And you're thinking, "You don't even know how to do your job. You're trying to tell me how to do my job." <laughs> How many times that happened to you? Somebody trying to tell you, you're like, you're like the worst person I know that works here. You're trying to tell me that I didn't do a good job? 
Has that been happening to anybody here where somebody's been critical, critical of you at work? And you know for a fact, God is your witness that they are a moron. All right? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you, you would testify in front of Jesus and the Heavenly Father. Like, Lord God, this person's a moron. All right? <laughs> all right. Are you saying I'm a moron? No. Oh, okay. You're just waving at me? Oh, would you? I was going to say, um, when other people are nasty to me, mm-hmm. I want to let them have it. Right. But I That's know, our flesh. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Just because they're nasty doesn't mean I have to be nasty. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we're talking about right here. And the thing is, I have been unpleasant to be around when I get in my head the wrong way. If I get sideways in my head, I am not the nicest person to be around. All right? And that's why, that's my struggle. My struggle is to, okay, Lord, straighten my head out here. And different situations, you realize every one of us has the power to do that. Everybody, everybody here, look at me, y'all. Everybody here has the power to, to get ourselves straight because it's all based on our priorities. When I think of myself as, let's say, being over somebody else, I can be as unpleasant as I want to be and feel good about it. But when somebody else is above me, in, whether it's my boss or whether it's the owner of the company, the owner of the company walks in, it is not hard for me to restrain my tongue because I'm thinking, where's the owner of the company? This guy's a millionaire. He might, he, you know, he's he's going to look at what I've been doing. Maybe he's going to give me a promotion. We can all shut it up when we need to. It's, the problem is that we don't, get, we don't prioritize people up. We put everybody, most of the time, underneath us. We think, well, my opinion is more important than your opinion. And so it's really important. It's really easy for me to lose my temper at you. Versus if that was the, uh, let's say the president of your company walked in and you knew they had the power to promote you to general manager of the store where you're making a hundred thousand dollars next year, it's very easy for you to shut your mouth. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're a Kentucky fan; they're wearing a Louisville shirt. You're not going to say anything. You're going to like, yes, sir. Oh man, how, what do you think of y'all's new coach? <laughs> you're not going to say anything negative because why? We know how to shut our mouths. The problem is we. We just disrespect people too much. All of us do. We, we put people down here, and we should have them up here. But I'm not, I'm not saying put them above you. Put, put, don't put them below you. You all hear what I'm saying? We shouldn't be putting people like, okay, well, I'm not much better than you, but I'm a little better. Right. <laughs> we, like to, we like to like, I'm a little better than you because I've been clean like six months. You only been clean for a week and a half. <laughs> you might, might, might make it this time. I don't think you're going to. And then we put people down here instead of saying, hey, let's put you right next to you. We're, you're my brother. You're my sister. What do you say, brother? Isn't that also like a... Do not judge your, don't judge another, but judge it within yourself first. And then it's like I got to say, okay, mm-hmm. the day is the Lord's, not mine. Yes, exactly. And then yep. when there is a situation, I say, Lord, what's going on? Mm-hmm. How do I go through it? And a lot of times I keep my mouth shut. And I get to learn something. There might be something in me that Always. doesn't need to change. Right. Yep. And then again, maybe there's a time to speak that the brother or sister may hear that there was something for them to grow and then we could be in agreement that neither one of us but we needed each other to help point us in the right direction. God uses people like that. Exactly. Sometimes God point brings a big person in your life and points out a flaw and I don't care who you are that's never fun. I don't care who you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. That's not fun. Okay? It's not fun when somebody points out a flaw because they might point it out in an unpleasant way, which they usually do. It's usually unpleasant, but it's usually true. Basically keeping someone accountable. Keeping yourself accountable. They're keeping you accountable. God knows we need accountability. Every one of us does. And in recovery, we need way more accountability. Yeah. Tina? I was going to say, too, mm-hmm. wrongful association, too. Absolutely. You yes. To be out of that. Just so Don't hang around and to be Well, my next lesson, not this one, but my next lesson actually is partly about that. Well, that's a good point. Wrongful association. But I'm going to, I have something the Lord gave me this morning when I was meditating. But yeah, wrongful associations. But you know, even when you're in the wrong crowd, sometimes God uses somebody that says, hey, well, it's just like when Peter was standing there denying Christ. He's standing around a barrel of people that weren't godly. And they pointed out, weren't you one of his? And God still used that to convict Peter because he, was, he wasn't strong in his faith yet. He was, he was confused, I believe. I don't think he turned against God or Jesus, except he did deny Jesus. Because he was afraid that he was going to get taken up there and we whipped and beaten and everything like that. But our flesh is our biggest enemy. And sometimes God uses unpleasant sources to convict us of our sin. Sometimes God brings people around that, and the, the fact is, most of the time they probably didn't do it right. Now, that's why when we get counsel, and I would advise you, go to Brother Walker, go to our preacher, go to uh, uh, maybe a, a help, get help from your challenge leader if you're in our youth. We want to have people in place that are going to give you 
uh, godly instruction. Because when you're in the world, what they give you is, is criticism. And sometimes those criticisms are correct, but we don't want to take them because we didn't, we didn't, it didn't come to us, you know, like a piece of toast with butter on it. It, it came to us, you know, like somebody had stepped on it and just mashed it up and then shoved it in your mouth. Like, oh, that's disgusting. But you still needed it because you needed to eat, okay? And so why don't you go get godly counsel from people who do have your best interests at heart? And when they correct you, why don't you listen to it? Every week, every week, every week, every week, and I can say this, uh, not last week, no, I'm kidding. Every week, people I talk to and give them counsel, they don't do what I ask them to do. Every week, it happens. It's not like, oh, once in a blue moon. Uh, I don't have any clue compared to what Brother Walker has to do with because we've got like 400 and some members of our church. So the most of the time when he talks to people, there's a problem. People don't call the preacher and say, hey, Brother Walker, I had a great day at work. I got a chance to testify and uh, give out a couple of tracts and pass out a John and Romans over here. Uh, there was a person walked through the parking lot. Just want to let you know I had a great day. Nobody calls the preacher and says that. It's like, Brother Walker, my aunt's over in the hospital here over at St. Joe. Would you have a chance to go talk to her or send somebody over to talk to her? And that's why he is there. He understands that. It's, it's not a surprise, okay? Brother Walker, has been doing this 32 years. Same for RU. I don't get people saying this and this is good. That's why we have testimony time. Because we need to remind each other that God's still doing miracles and God's still working and doing things all the time. We need to remind each other that. But most of the time my calls are, can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? And I, I understand that's part of my job. All right? Every week that's part of my job. And don't stop calling. Okay? Just don't do it after midnight or before 6 in the morning. But it's okay. You can. I won't, I won't take any of this. But... Uh, mm -hmm. If we live by the principles that God gives us, if we live by the principles of, of separating from the wrong crowd, getting close to the right crowd, uh, not listening to our flesh, giving our flesh what it needs but not everything it wants. Okay, you realize if you give your flesh everything it wants, you will be out of sorts. Okay, you probably won't be well fed nutritionally. You'll probably be overfed calorically. And then you, what happens is, as we continue to ingest more calories than we're burning in a day, our body has to retain them somewhere, and then our, we get out of shape, and then our joints start to hurt and start to fail, because you put uh, mecha any kind of mechanical sy system, you put it under a load that it's not designed to handle. If you have a half-ton press and you put three tons on it, it's going to fail sooner than it should have. It might have lasted 20 years if it was only handling half a ton at a time, but we put three tons on it. The same thing happens to our knees, y'all. All right. Yes, I'm only a ton and a half, but I only have half ton knees, so I'm working down to try to get down to a ton. Okay. So you realize as we make bad decisions, little small bad decisions, over and over and over and over and over, cause things to break down. And God says, make that right decision now. Make that right decision now. How many times have we stopped? And it's silly. It really is silly. How many times have we stopped? It's like, hmm, I wonder, should I read my Bible or should I just go take a nap? Should I? You get ready to turn the TV on. You're like, you know what? Hey, I can work on one of my challenges in RU. you? Eh. And you just turn the TV on and watch TV instead. Or you go do about whatever you're doing instead of working on stuff you know you're going to work on. See, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And we all tend to waste some of it. Okay, some less than others. And we do need to have downtime, by the way. You need to have time to just rest and let your brain kind of like unwind. Because what the world does is the world over there just cranking and cranking and cranking. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a crank spring, you know, on, on a thing. You, you crank it up, crank it up. And eventually it's going to go, it's going to have to release all that. And so... If you're getting really good at working through problems and stuff in your day, you got to let God let it unwind without hurting somebody that didn't even bother you, okay? Too many people come home with these stress and problems, and then their family gets hurt. Or their friends get hurt. They didn't mean, but what happens is they didn't realize that this person also had a very tightly wound spring, and they hit each other and went, bam! <laughs> Sorry, girl. Sorry, sorry. Well, that's what happens. Okay. They needed to unwind. You needed to unwind. And instead of doing it in a healthy way, like putting on boxing gloves, you start saying ugly things to each other. Or, or you start pointing out flaws. And you point out one thing, and she's like, well, I didn't see him do anything around us. All right. Yeah. And you think you're going to say something about that? All right. And then it gets really ugly. And neither one of you have wanted to hurt each other. You just didn't release the tension in a spiritual, healthy way. Okay? And the same thing I guarantee you happens in every every house represented here, all the Walker houses, all the Isaiah houses, every house. Why? Because tensions build up. And sometimes people just need to be away from other people. And that's all you need. You just need to be away from somebody else for a little while and then 
you can unwind, you come back, you're like, okay, I can handle this a little bit longer. All right? Because how many of you know what gear ratios are? You know, one gear fits into another gear. So you got a little small gear and it fits another gear. But sometimes, some gears, when they turn, they make this other gear just turn a whole lot. It's like, even a little bit, it's like, <laughs> and so you get a bad gear, and you're like, yeah! Like some people can only be handled in very, very, very small doses, right? Because they just wind everybody up. Yeah. And you gotta, where's that clutch? Where's the clutch? You know, pull them out, pull out. You know, we're having trouble here. We're about, to, we're about to lose the whole transaxle. Now, verse 14. Let's finish up with this. This is where we should live. This is where we should be. We're going to get in trouble in the world. Why don't we get in trouble for doing the right thing instead of for doing the wrong thing? Verse 14 of chapter 4. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, most of the time we are not reproached for the name of Christ. I'll tell you, 99% of the time, everybody in this room has ever gotten in trouble. It wasn't because you were being a good Christian. Okay? That's 99%. Now, maybe 1%. Maybe your boss says, hey, you're not, you just got to quit talking about Jesus here at work. You know, we, we, we'd rather talk about, you know, UK losing the last, you know, first game of the, of the tournament. That, that's what we want to talk about. We don't want to talk about good stuff here. You're not going to, most of the time, we're not getting in trouble for doing the right thing. You're getting in trouble because maybe you just responded poorly to somebody. But when you start to try to be Christ-minded and Christ-like and Christ, the spirit of Christ filling your heart and your mind all the time, all the time, all the time. Eventually, you are going to run up to people that that makes them very upset. Okay, you're their reverse skill. You're their, you're the one that's going to wind them up because they don't want to hear anything about Jesus. Oh well, why do you, why do some people think that faith based recovery doesn't work? Because they see people that are supposedly in faith based recovery, but they're not working their faith based recovery. Oh yeah, I go to this meeting here from time to time, but I'm not really working it, and so it's going to give it's going to give faith based recovery a bad name. If you stay there very long, I will tell you, I will promise you this. If you start walking with God and start working in your faith, faith-based recovery works, okay? It works. It's the only one that works. There's people who can learn the certain processes and they can set, find, like I said, the steps or whatever. That's fine if they're working it and they make that part of themselves and they say, okay, I'm going to make this structure bigger than I am. They're elevating it above themselves so that that structure tells them what to do. That can help people stay clean. I'm not saying it doesn't. It does because you have to have that structure. It doesn't matter whether you're in faith-based or if you're in AA or wherever you are. But some people refuse to put the structure there. And if they refuse to do that, they're supposed to go into faith-based. They're not even doing it. They're just showing up to meetings. But they're not journaling every day. They're not reading their Bible every day. They're not talking to God every day. Okay? They're not in faith-based recovery any more than walking in that door makes you a Baptist. Okay? Just because you came to Mount Olive Baptist Church this morning does not make anybody here a Baptist. When you adopt that faith and you say, you know what, that's my doctrine. I'm going to follow what's in the King James Bible. That's what I'm going to believe. That's what makes you a Baptist. All right, not what signs on the on the on the on the on the on the building out there, or what church you came into. And you say, well, you mean if I go to a Catholic church for twenty years, that doesn't make me Catholic? No, not if you don't believe what they believe. You're just having to hang out with them. See, there's people come in every Friday night to are you? They're not doing their challenges. They're not doing anything. Are they involved in faith-based recovery? No, they're there. We love the fact that they're there. We hope that something clicks, and I can do what? Hey, I can do my challenges this week. I could. I could read my Bible today. How many, uh, I shouldn't ask that, I was going to ask how many of y'all have to think about brushing teeth, but knowing some of you, that might not be good, so. <laughs> Sorry, brother. I wouldn't talk about you. <laughs> you guys say that. <laughs> if I said, how many of y'all have to think about eating? Some of us, when we get in our madness, we do stop thinking about eating because you don't, you're not hungry for the lot. But as a, as a rule, when you're regular, when you're just doing normal stuff, you don't have to think about eating. You're planning to eat. Right, how many of y'all plan to eat some food today besides those delicious donuts back there? You're planning to eat today, right? Okay. Are you going to have to decide? Like, Christian, you're going to think, I wonder if I'm going to have lunch today. Nah, Monday's coming. But that's what you think about with your Bible. Am I going to read my Bible today? Yeah, I can always, I can always read it tomorrow. That's not what you're going to think about lunch. That's not what you're going to think about that burger. No, you're like, you know what? I need it. I'm hungry right now. See, that's what you have to treat, the walk, walking with God, the spiritual side. You start treating it like that. You are going to have people that are going to reproach you for God's sake because they're not going to want to hear about it. I guarantee you, several of you that have been working on your testimony, let's say six months or longer, you've gone places and shared it, and people really just didn't want to hear it. Like, why? Because now you had something to talk about. Okay, when you're new, when your recovery is early, like 
24 hour kind of situation, you don't have anything to share yet. You're, you're like, I just hope nobody gets on my last nerve today because I'm going to make it to tomorrow. I'm going to make it to 48. I'm going to make it to a week. And that's, everybody starts there. So, by the way, that's okay. But once you start working, working your program and doing what God wants you to do, you will have a testimony and you need to share it. You need to tell people. You need to tell people how good God's been to you. Okay? And it's okay to brag on people here. Somebody here might have helped you. Maybe somebody gave you a ride somewhere. Maybe somebody uh, did, did, you, did you a solid. It's okay to thank them and to, to acknowledge it. If you have a share time, then hey, you know what? I appreciate Rod being here and he's he's helping out in the uh, Living Waters uh, RU group over there. That's okay to talk about. It's okay to, to mention. Why? Because everybody here needs to hear somebody with a mouth acknowledge when they do good, when they do well. You need to hear that. There's nothing wrong with that. We give out awards. If you come to RU, if you, if you come and do so many challenges, you get an award because you're doing your work. Now, guess what? The main rewards, the ones that are way more important, the ones we get from God. But I don't see anything wrong with us pointing out that sometimes people are a blessing to us. Sometimes people help us. And if you do suffer as a Christian, we're going to finish with this verse here. Verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Okay? I can't glorify God when I suffer because of my sin. But I can definitely glorify God when I suffer because that I'm trying to do what's right. Wouldn't that be a good place to be when you know that if you're suffering, it's not because you relapsed or you owe somebody some money for something you took off them, but you're suffering for God's sake? Because that gives you something to praise God about. Okay? When those disciples were whipped after town after town, they went to and they preached, and then the local priest would, would arrest them on false charges, say, oh, they're, they're stirring up the public, they're, they're causing a public public uh, a nuisance over here. We're going to take them over here and put them in jail. And then they would whip them and beat them. They came out. The Bible says they, they, were, they were shouting and singing God's praises in the jail. And when they came out, they had a really good story to say, you know what? We went to this town. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. Well, the people did. So a bunch of people were getting saved. But those local priests, they, they didn't want to hear that there was uh, somebody that, that uh, was going to love them and they didn't have to pay their way to get to heaven. They just had to come and believe on Jesus. And they, they threw us in jail. It's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, they, they whipped us and everything like that. But guess what? God still got glory because more people kept getting saved. There's people back there right now telling other people how to get saved. Isn't that awesome? Now, I hope you don't get whipped or beat today, all right? But if it's for Christ's sake, give God the glory. Why don't we say, Lord, help me to kill this old flesh today. I mean, just kill it stone dead, shoot it in the head, Lord, and help me to live in the Holy Spirit. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you've never been saved, you always want to have an opportunity for you to get saved. And that's accepting Christ as your Savior. Knowing for sure when you die, you go to heaven. Nothing in this world is more important than that. Not where you work, not who you know, not who you marry. Knowing Jesus, knowing our Savior. Because he died on the cross to save you. What a shame to ignore such a tremendous gift. And if you've never done that, please come with me. I want to show you from the Bible. The Bible says it's just an act of believing in your heart that Jesus died on the cross. And if you believe it, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me my sin. Come to my heart and save me. I'm trusting only you, Jesus, and what you did on the cross. And please take me to heaven when I die. Now please help me to live for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Now in our hearts, if we pray that prayer, the Bible says that he saves us. I can't save you. Brother Spears, our other teacher, can't save you. Brother Walker, our pastor, as wonderful as a preacher is, that he can't save you. Jesus can save you, though. If you prayed that prayer in your heart for the first time, would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Anybody at all? Lord, I pray that you bless each one here this morning. Thank you for them listening so well. Thank you for the the truths you gave us in the book of 1 Peter, Lord, about how our flesh does try to trip us up. And Lord, we all have allowed it to do that. We've all allowed